the apostles are not here anymore. <laughs> and uh, they kind of knew that was going to happen. They uh, were aware they'd be departing. And uh, they had not parting shots, but parting words uh, from the Lord about how we are to uh, uh, hold close to the Scriptures, that they themselves were writing the Scriptures, that they had this prophetic word made more sure, and that this is the thing we ought to give our attention to, that it was able to supply for us an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Those are the positive things that they said, the instructions that they gave. But there's some other things that happened that they said about what was coming next after they were gone. And I think that that needs to be given, um, I guess that needs to be given consideration as well. The apostles not only gave instructions about how we know what the truth is and how we uh, carry on with the scriptures, but they also gave us warnings about things that would happen after they were gone. And everything they said is completely verifiable and true. We've seen all of these things take place. So it's worth looking through these together and taking the warnings from the apostles about the way things would go. There's a lot of, you know, the historical record, if you will, the way that, you know, the way that people conceive of what happened when the apostles died is that there was great confusion, that nobody knew what was going to happen, were not expecting them to leave, didn't know what to do about the Bible or even what the Bible was. You know, this is all satanic. That's None of that is true. They knew exactly what was happening and what exactly they were leaving. And they told us about the things that are recorded that happened after them. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4, starting at the 11th verse, down to the 14th verse, the Apostle Paul talks about the need for spiritual maturity. He said that God gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers to equip or for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Yes, the Lord gave apostles, they're gone. The Lord gave prophets, they ceased, those are over. But he gave also evangelists, we're still here, and pastors, they still exist, and teachers, those are still around. And the purpose of these offices in the church of the Lord is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Not to do the work themselves, but to equip everybody. Our job is to give you the word that you need to live the life that you ought to live and to teach those who are around you. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And the end result, he says here, is that we all come to a unity of the faith until, see, we all come to the unity of the faith, it's direction towards, it's building to something. To a mature man, or a perfect man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that means full-grown adult, <laughs> full-size, complete, mature. But especially in the 14th verse, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, It can't be the work of the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers to deal with doctrinal matters. It can't be the work of the evangelists and the elders and the Bible class teachers. Like They can't be the ones who are going to counter every wind of doctrine, every false teacher, every uh, thing that arises that is evil. Our job is to equip you to be able to do that. You're the ones who are supposed to be getting mature and growing. We all are. But I mean, remember what he said, these offices exist to equip the saints. The saints are the ones who are doing this work. The saints are the ones who should no longer be children carried about by every wind of doctrine. So the first warning from Paul is that God expects spiritual maturity from everybody. It's no longer in a growth stage. 
where all the knowledge is consolidated in some individuals numbering about 12? No, now the testimony is complete. The Bible is, is finished, and it's time for this to be disseminated for everybody. Everybody is to grow and to learn. <clears throat> when you look back at Acts 20, when Paul appeared before the, well, actually, he summoned the elders of Ephesus to himself. He did commend them to God and to the word of his grace. As we mentioned before there in the 32nd verse, and that's very important. Did not name a successor, but put them instead onto the word. However, prior to that, the things that it says are kind of difficult. He said, I know that you all will see my face never again in the 25th verse. He's going to die. But then in the 26th verse down through 31, he said, Therefore I testify to you this day, I'm innocent of the blood of all men, for I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among your own selves, men will rise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years, which is the amount of time he was among them at Ephesus, for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is the testimony of Paul to the elders at Ephesus. After I leave, savage wolves will come in among you. And some will arise from your own selves from among you elders, speaking twisted things, or perhaps from the congregation there, but whatever it is, some coming from outside and some coming from inside the congregation. That's all that the point is there. And his conclusion, again, is the 31st verse. Therefore, watch, remember, three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. We have to pay attention, we have to be alert, and as he said, we have to take warning. And there has to be warning. It just, you know, seems not happy, I guess. But it's, well, I guess it's not happy that people do these things, but they do. We can't pretend that it doesn't happen and bury our heads in the sand. It does happen, and so we have to fulfill our duty, our maturity in Christ to know about these things, to do something about these things, to be watchful, to pay attention, to follow the example of the apostle who sounded warnings about this pretty constantly. And Paul said also in his second letter to Corinth, in the 11th verse, or I'm sorry, the 11th chapter, he said to them he was quite worried about them, and we would say with good reason. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4, he said, I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he comes who preaches another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you've not accepted, you may well put up with that. He's afraid because these things come in and they seem to be allowed. They're given a chance to speak. They're given time to have this influence in the church, and they shouldn't. Which is why he continues there in the 13th verse. Such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Those aren't real. No wonder Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. 
But yes, we can't just put up with this, regardless of who they are, whether that be the fierce wolves that come in, not sparing the flock, or if that be people from among our own selves rising and speaking perverse things. We can't just put up with it. We can't be, allow ourselves to be led astray from that devotion to Christ. The, ser the servants of Satan definitely disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. What he's saying here is, it can be hard to tell the difference. And that's true. It can be hard to tell the difference. So we have to be watchful, and we have to be thoughtful. And if something comes in, and it's a different spirit, a different Jesus, a different gospel, we don't just put up with that. We don't allow that. We don't go along with that. But Paul was not alone in being afraid. Peter was also afraid. If you look at 2 Peter 2 and 3, we, that's where we are when we look at his warnings. Yes, in the second chapter, he was fairly plain, saying there were false prophets among the people of Israel, and there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bringing on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words, for a long time their judgment has not been idle, their destruction does not slumber. Very similar, similar to what Paul had said, if you recall, as he described their uh, different uh, spirit, different Jesus, different gospel, as he described their disguise as servants of light, but that their ends would correspond to their deeds. So it is here. There are going to be false teachers. They will be brought in secretly. The way of truth will be blasphemed, but their judgment has not been idle. Their destruction does not slumber. They're not going to get away with this. But there's the warning. First, there is there will there were false prophets among the people, and there will be false teachers among you. Too often, brethren, go down the path of saying, well, we should just talk about false doctrine and not name names. But that's not what Peter said. He did not say there will be false teachings among you. He said there will be false teachers among you. Because it is personal. It does get personal. No, it's not personal in that I don't like their personality. It's personal in that they are doing it. That's There's a person who is doing this. There's a person who is saying this. There's a person who is using his or her influence to accomplish what is error. So they have to be identified. But he said they were stealthy. They'd be brought in secretly. And in addition to that, many will follow their destructive ways. And because of that, the truth is blasphemed. The, the apostles knew that when they were gone, there were going to come in people who would pretend to be apostles, people who would pretend to be authoritative teachers of God's Word, but they actually were not appealing to the authority of Scripture. They were not pointing back to book, chapter, and verse for everything that they said, but they looked like they were, and they came from the churches. They, some of them even knew the apostles personally. What you're going to find is that there's a large number, well, not a large, but th there's a significant number of people who are accorded a special status in history, the first generation of people after the apostles. They're considered fathers of the church. They're the ones who knew the apostles personally and would go about speaking with reference to this fact. And yet, when we examine what they wrote, and I plan to do that at least one time, you're going to find that the apostles told us about them. And it wasn't when they spoke of those who were good. It was in these passages. These are the passages that warned us about those people. The way of truth is blasphemed because of this. They thought those were Christians. 
They thought those were authorities in the scriptures, but they're not. Sometimes, you know, you see churches today not doing right, and sometimes they're so far away from what is right and so far away from justice that you just wish that they would take the sign down. You just wish they would change their name. Stop saying you're a church of Christ. That's not what you are. That's the meaning of this, what Peter said. The way of truth is blasphemed by this. It's true. It is what has happened. And in his third chapter, he continues this idea in the third verse. Know this first. Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, that is what people say. Where is this Jesus? The apostles are gone and everything's just like it used to be. Well, that's not true. This they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed, being flooded with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. The scoffers are coming, he said. They just follow their own desires. They pretend like everything is just like it always has been, but it's not. The world was very different before the flood, and the flood did come on the world of the ungodly because the world was ungodly. It's exactly why that happened. And the current world is reserved for fire by the same word of God and for the same reasons. To say all things continue as they were from the beginning is false. That's to pretend that there's no judgment of God, that there's no condemnation for sin, that there's not going to be a reckoning, there's not going to be a judgment. Those are just scoffers. But Peter said, oh yes, know that first. This is here. And in his 17th verse, he said, knowing this, beloved, beforehand, be diligent, um, Beware, lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Don't lose your own stability to this. You know beforehand that we told you this was going to happen. You be careful not to be carried away with the error of lawless people. Remember what Paul said, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, carried by every false argument. Peter said this to you. You know beforehand that this is coming. You be careful. What about John? You know what's surprising about John? We go to 1 John chapter 2. But what I found surprising about John was I thought, you know, the way that kind of makes sense to organize these things is by the apostles themselves. We can look at them in order, look at Paul and Peter and John. And at first I had this question in my mind when I was preparing the, the, this lesson, thinking, uh, what, what all am I going to find in John? I have a couple of ideas. Little did I know that actually the warnings from John far outnumber the warnings from the other apostles. <laughs> People just don't understand John, I think. His simple way of speaking and his way of putting things next to each other, sentences next to each other without a whole lot of words in between to explain the relationship of them leads people to think that he's just a simple man with simple ideas. But that's not true at all. He actually has quite a bit to say that we need to take to heart. In 1 John 2, verse 18, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, that is to say the opposite of Christ. Even now many Antichrists have already come, by which we know it is the last hour. In the time that John was alive, there are already people who are opposing the doctrine of Jesus. They went out from us. 
These are not the wolves, the savage wolves that Paul talked about that come in not sparing the flock. No, these are the men that rise from among us speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Yes, 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been, they would have continued with us. But they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them were from us. It has to be the case. And John embraces this and makes very clear that it has to be this way, that it's clear, it's manifest, that they are not from us. People think that division is the worst sin that any church can commit. And that's not true at all. Paul said it. Peter said it. John here is making it very clear. Sometimes they have to go out from us because they are not of us. And that has to be clear. No, division is not the worst sin. Sometimes you have to divide when people will not repent, when they will not stand for truth, when they will not allow justice, they need to leave. It needs to become clear that they are not part of this. At verse 26, these things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Yeah, there's already people working on the churches. In the lifetime of John, they're already working on them. There's already false teachers. There are already those who oppose Jesus in their teaching. And he said they're not from us. They have to go out so that it's clear that they're not from us. I'm writing this to you, though, to you about those who are trying to deceive you. And in the fourth chapter of this same letter, he said these things that are important though oft overlooked. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. John says that we do not make assumptions as the children of God. We don't make assumptions. Or should we say we're not supposed to make assumptions? <laughs> Let's put it that way. We're not supposed to make assumptions, and yet people do very often. Right? Somebody shows up and says, oh, I am this per I'm related to this person. I'm this person's brother, or I'm this person's cousin. There may not be any other questions of that individual before they're allowed to place membership. But that's not right. Just because you're related to somebody, just because your name is such and such, that doesn't mean anything. What do you believe? Where do you worship? What is your relationship with that church? What do they teach in that church? These are valid questions for anybody who wants to be a part of the fellowship because we have to be watchful and we have to be careful. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Why, John? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. It's already the case. Just as we saw that th these antichrists are already out, as he said, in number, in force, so also there are many false teachers who have gone out into the world, or many yeah, false prophets. We're talking about spirit. We're really talking about the attitude or the approach to the scriptures. But what are these false spirits? It is the second verse. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit confessing Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess Christ has come in the flesh is not from God. This, rather, is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now already in the world. What does it mean? It means obedience. I realize that it's a lot of words here, but what he's getting at is this, right? The Spirit of God confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. What does it mean? It means he had a body as you and I have a body. Why is that important? Because it means that we in our bodies are able to obey. We can obey. We can overcome sin. 
through God who strengthens us, yes, but we can overcome sin, we can obey, and indeed we must do so. The false prophets do not confess Christ having come in the flesh. These are every religious person today who preaches that salvation is by faith alone, apart from works. Everybody today who says you don't have to be baptized to be saved, why not? Because that's a work, and you're not saved by works, you're saved by flesh. You know what that is? That's the Antichrist. That's the opposite of Jesus. He would never tell you it is okay to thumb your nose at God and not do what he says. That's the opposite of Jesus. Don't you see? Is it everywhere? Yes, it's everywhere. It's the national religion of America. Yes, it's everywhere. And it started way back then. It's not new with Calvin. Everybody talks about Calvin and Calvinism. Well, he's the latest, you know, let's be honest. He's the latest European to talk about it. <laughs> but it was around a long time before Calvin. You can see the friends of Job espousing this doctrine. No, the false prophets of those who say Jesus did not come in the flesh. You know what? If he did not have a body as you and I have a body, if he was not tempted in all points like as we yet without sin, then he is no mediator. Don't you see the great damage that it does? It does ter terrible damage to think that we don't have to obey because somehow our flesh is weak or unable or incapable of obedience. That destroys everything that Jesus came and lived for and died for. That's why he calls it Antichrist. It's the opposite of Jesus. But he continues in the fourth verse, You, however, are of God, little children, and you have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not from God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Who do you listen to? But who do they listen to? By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, said verse 6. That refers back to chapter, or I'm sorry, to chapter 4 and verse 1. Don't believe every spirit. Test them to see whether they're from God. Why are we saying it? Because... Who do they listen to? Do they listen to the apostles? Do they demand book, chapter, and verse? When you ask why they're doing what they're doing, do they talk about the long-standing tradition of the church? Do they talk about the restoration movement? Do they talk about Florida College? Do they talk about their favorite teachers, the greatest minds in the brotherhood? Or do they give you book, chapter, and verse for what they're doing. I'll tell you, one of those answers is better than the other. We're from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. That's the apostles. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. If you need more than the Bible, you're not a child of God. What do you need? What do you listen to? And I, yeah, I re I remind you of the time I spoke with a brother. I, I remember that I don't even remember exactly what the question was, but some uh, mutual uh, uh, friend of ours came to me and said, "Hey, I have this problem. The brother here is not helping me with this with this thing. In fact, I think he's wrong about it." So I contacted this brother, very well known preacher. In fact, he's even been to South Austin uh, uh, at least a couple of times to hold meetings. And I contacted him and said, brother, what is this? You know, I don't, I don't see the Bible for this. Here are the verses that I've got. And he replied to me saying, I don't think we need to talk about this. You need to get this debate between these two brothers. That'll answer your questions. That was, that's what he said to me, what he sent back this gospel preacher. To which, of course, I replied, because that's what I do. 
But, uh, you know, to which I replied, are you a gospel preacher? Why don't you give me some Bible verses for what you're saying? If the, if the debate has anything useful in it, isn't it what the Bible says? If in this debate they pointed to some Bible verses and you found that helpful, can you not just tell me what those verses are? Isn't that true, brethren? Not because I'm mean about it, but because isn't that true? What do you listen to? Do we need more than what the apostles said? Truly. Can't you just give me those verses? What kind of preacher can't produce the verses? What is this? I'm afraid that we know, don't we? Second John, you know, it wasn't just that first letter of his. He's got three of them. <laughs> He said in the seventh verse of his second letter, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Why did he say that? Because of verse 6. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. You see how much John emphasizes commandment keeping in the body? That's the doctrine of the Lord. Why are you saying that, John? Because, 2 John 7, many deceivers have gone out into the world who don't confess Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and the opposite of Christ. Look to yourselves that we don't lose the things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Yeah, they also tell me you can't lose your salvation, but that's not what John said. He said, look to yourself so that we don't lose what we worked for. Many deceivers have gone out into the world teaching Salvation by faith alone, without works. That's error. Yes, in the ninth verse, he finishes out, whoever transgresses and doesn't abide in the teaching of Christ doesn't have God. Whoever abides in the teaching of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and doesn't bring this doctrine, this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not greet him. He who greets him shares in his evil deeds. You notice the way that John words this. When people come, and according to 1 John 4, we test the spirits. When we are testing, they're supposed to bring something. You notice that? <laughs> if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him. You're supposed to bring the book. You're supposed to bring the truth. If they come and they don't bring this teaching, they don't have any harbor here. You're supposed to bring it, man. Bring what? Bring the Bible. Bring the truth. Bring the scriptures. Look, too, at the finality of what John is saying. When he writes to the others saying, do it this way, test them this way, doesn't that imply that the teaching is complete, that the teaching is final, that there is a thorough a thorough standard to which all preachers can be held? There's finality about John's words. I might have an entire lesson on that. There were so many references when I started going down that avenue. There's so many places where John is assuming that you already know, and you should be referring to what you know to test things. They have to bring it. It pre-exists. Even in John's day. And yes, when you look at the end of the Revelation, the last thing that John wrote, these I would take, you know, just without a lot of commentary. Oops, got the wrong one. Revelation 22, verses 18 through 19, that's where we are. Jesus said, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone uh, takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, from the things written in the book. 
The book of Revelation, of course, quotes from all the other books of the Bible, so it stands for the Bible. We don't take away from God's Word. We don't add to God's Word. The warning of John about false teachers is fairly plain. The warning of John about fellowship is fairly plain. The warning of John through the Revelation, I think, is also plain. We need this book. In fact, what we need to do is we need to demand this book and this book only. This book only. I'm pulling a quotation out of Ecclesiastes 12 to guide the thoughts here, um, which says, the words of the wise are like goads. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 11. The words of the wise are like goads, like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They're given by one shepherd. We can't make the words of God anymore, you know? The apostles were writing it, and they knew they were writing it, and they said, you should pay attention to what we said. And they said, after we're gone, you'll have our letters, and you don't add to these words, and you don't take from these words. We can't make any more of the, of the word of God, but, but we best apply the word of God. They're goads. That is to say, they, they goad you on. They push you to do things. That's what the word of God does. Like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. That is to say, our stability comes from the Bible. That's the collected sayings. And yes, they're given by one shepherd. God Almighty is the one who is behind all of it. When you put together all that the apostles said about their inspiration, about their writings, and all the warnings that they gave us about what would happen after they were gone, how false teachers would arise, what they're really saying, right? The New Testament is saying that the New Testament is all there is. They're saying this is it. There's not something more. There's not something coming. You take this. You hold to this. You demand this. That's what you are. And what's that tell us? It tells us that everything else that has come along since, and there's been a lot, is unauthorized. It's unrelated to God. It's ungodly. It can't be right. It can't be true. There's no way for it to be allowable or admissible and for the apostles to be telling the truth at the same time. You're going to have to choose whom you believe. Do you believe the apostles and what they said about themselves, their own writings, and what would happen after them? Or do you believe those who came after them who said, Oh, yeah, we were good friends, and I am the successor. Which one are you going to believe? That's what it comes down to. The New Testament is all that there is, friends. And thankfully, that's all that we need. The Word of God gives us everything that we need to be saved. It gives us everything we need to know the truth, to have forgiveness with Him. And much more. It's a fantastic testimony to the power of God, the scriptures are. All the things that are written about Jesus, all the miracles that are recorded in here, they all bear testimony to the power of God among people through his word, generation after generation after generation. Today, are you a Christian? Are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus for forgiveness of sins? Do so. Why wait? We have water prepared to help you. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent. Look at what the apostles said. Look at how important, as he said, I didn't cease to warn everybody night and day with tears. It was very important to them. Shouldn't it be important to me too? Shouldn't it matter to me? The saving power of God is here at my fingertips in my phone. <laughs> Do I ever pull it out? And use it? Do I ever read it? Do I ever share it with anybody else? Don't they need to know the truth too? Don't they deserve to have forgiveness too? Today, if you as a Christian haven't lived right, repent. Put God first in life. Let us pray together because we are all guilty of having done this at some point in time. 
that today we can help you to become a Christian, or if we can help you as a Christian to restoration in the faith, please let your need in the Spirit be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs> 